thanks uh, to uh, thanks Kanchan, thanks to the ORF for having me. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, probably my, I think it's my first time at the ORF, so thanks for having me here. Um, he, um, also looking forward to uh, my old colleague Ila's uh, reactions as well. So, so this is actually joint work with uh, Josh, uh, who was the IMF res rep in India, and uh, as I say, he's my chief economic advisor, has been my chief economic advisor uh, for many years now. So, so, so uh, let me quickly go through uh, what the sequence is. I'm going to give you a bit of background, uh, talk about the current debate, then give, uh, spend most of the time uh, spelling out our diagnosis, and then offering some, you know, way out some, you know, what to do, what not to do kind of thing. Um, as you know, the, the headline numbers have been coming down, GDP numbers have been coming down. Um, but you all know my views on, you know, how much information uh, the GDP numbers carry. So uh, I, you know, I'll, we look more at the numbers behind the, you know, the more the disaggregated numbers. And this is where we find ourselves today. Um, this is a chart of, you know, a kind of, a few key macroeconomic indicators, and what you find is that does the uh, um, so, so what you find is that you know on the left hand side you see consumption and investment, on the right hand side you see trade and direct taxes. Um, the last point is for the first whatever seven eight months for which data are available, and what you find is that uh, the um, major kind of macro demand indicators, investment consumption trade, taxes, are either in negative growth territory, sometimes substantially so, like in the case of uh, uh, IIP capital goods and non-oil imports, or they're in barely positive growth territory. So, so, so while the headline numbers say something, I think the disaggregated numbers uh, convey, uh, you know, a picture that's uh, arguably bleaker than, than the headline numbers, but it's all in negative growth territory or barely positive growth territory. And these are the, you know, three, four major uh, growth engines. Um, so, so the question is that, look, given that, uh, you know, the headline number is something like four and a half, um, we look at uh, previous uh, instances of slowdowns, and, and one good reference point, of course, is the NDA slowdown between 2000 and 2002, where GDP growth was about 4.5%. And if you look at the underlying indicators today, and uh, what was what prevailed at that point in time, which showed a GDP of four and a half percent, you find that you know all these you know uh, major uh, demand indicators or major macro indicators, they are kind of very different. You know, uh, even even in that NDA slowdown, you know th they were all in in positive uh, growth territory and sometimes substantially so. Uh, then you say, well, does it resemble 1991? Uh, I just want to make absolutely clear, of course, is that 1991, we had a major macro crisis uh, that was, uh, and today we're nowhere even close to that. Our macro situations is very sound, lots of reserves, low current account deficit, you know, until recently, very low inflation. Um, but if you look at the real side of the economy and look at that same, in, look at those same indicators, it seems like, you know, uh, exports, imports, capital, consumption, uh, you know, the indicators are, you know, resemble what happened more in 1991 when actually growth was about 1%. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so if you compare on the left-hand side is today, uh, the NDA1 slowdown, the 91-92 episode, you see that the indicators are really uh, much closer to 1991-92. Uh, and then, of course, you look at this uh, num uh, uh, chart, electricity generation growth, and you find that in the first seven or eight months, you know, it's kind of unprecedentedly low. I mean, the last few months, it's been in negative growth territory, which has kind of never happened before. Of course, I think one should treat the latest numbers with caution because there's also some amount of uh, maybe contamination by regulatory changes. Uh, but even so, I think uh, the picture is kind of very telling. So, so this is the sense in which we say this is not just uh, uh, any slowdown, that this is kind of a, a great slowdown because we haven't seen anything like this for... A, a very long time where these underlying indicators are in such, uh, uh, you know, uh, poor territory. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. This is, all these things are at one level both puzzling and frustrating. Hmm? They're puzzling because 
Look, until six, nine months ago, we were saying we were the you know, fastest growing emerging market economy in the world. And you know, f how come within a space of about you know, six to nine months, we go from this absolute you know, buoyancy, almost triumphalism, uh, to a palpable sense that you know, the kind of bottom is falling off of the economy? Uh, how did this happen so quickly? Uh, that's a bit of a puzzle. Um, the frustration, of course, also is that, I mean, it's not as if the government, to be fair, has not been responding. It kind of has been aware of the problem. The RBI has been slashing interest rates. Government, you know, enacted a corporate tax cut, a pretty major and a desirable one. And, of course, it's put a lot of, uh, you know, things for privatization. It's, it has been doing a lot. It has been responding. And yet, kind of, it seems like the frustration is that nothing seems to be uh, working because, you know, uh, the economy is just, uh, you know, going south uh, in, in major ways. So, so that's why that's both puzzling and, fr and frustrating. Now, I think part of the frustration also, uh, you know, uh, watch is, is to watch the debate, because I think it's fair to say that uh, we have twice as many explanations for what's happening as there are people who are offering these explanations. You know, it, it's kind of like a, almost like, uh, you know, every possible explanation that you think, can you think of, is on the table. But I think you can broadly categorize these uh, explanations into two, two, two categories, structural or cyclical. It's kind of a shorthand way of saying, I mean, are these short-term factors or are these really, uh, you know, uh, long-term factors that have been in operation uh, for a long time? And just to give you a sense of, and I think there have been many thoughtful contributions to this debate. Uh, lots of interesting hypotheses have been offered. Uh, for example, there's you know a series of structural hypotheses. Uh, one which says you know not enough uh, uh, reforms, land, labor, business, and you know Raghu said this in his recent OP Jindal lectures. Mihir here has been very active in saying we need more structural reforms. So that's one hypothesis. More recently, Ratin has uh, put forward an interesting hypothesis about how uh, we should understand this as a long-run increase in inequality, combined with the fact that you know all the income has been going to the top. Uh, that top has now reached its satiation point, so consumption has collapsed, and therefore growth has collapsed. You know, Ratin and Andy Mukherjee have been very active on that. Um, and of course, more recently, there's a kind of a little bit more from the political side, uh, the view articulated by Dr. Manmohan Singh, Kaushik Basu, and Raghu, that actually it's, uh, there's a problem of governance. You know, either there's too much uncertainty and fear, too much centralization of power, or you know, lack of trust, and this is kind of uh, uh, explains the structural hypothesis. L let me just say that with, I mean, Clearly, all, all explanations offered are going to have some, some merit. But I think uh, what I'm going to argue is that structural hypotheses, by definition, are going to have problems because you know, we have to explain both a kind of long-run uh, slowdown and a kind of collapse in the last a couple of years. So uh, a structural hypothesis can perhaps explain some of the longer things, but you'd have to say something about why these structural things got worse in the last few years that explains the collapse. So, you know, so that's kind of a, like a, almost like a problem with structural hypotheses. Um, and, and also, I think, remember with all this land labor uh, laws, I mean, we've not done land and labor reforms for a very long time, and yet suddenly, uh, you know, uh, the economy is, is kind of slowed down dramatically. Moreover, I think for me, what's been new and to think about is that, you know, we didn't have these land and labor reforms for a very long time, and yet between 2002 and 2011, 12, you know, India grew gangbusters, even without lack of reforms. Of course, the external environment was very favorable, but then you can't say that this was the binding constraint, or is today the binding constraint on growth, let alone uh, an explanation for a serious kind of collapse in the economy. Um, so Ratan's argument, which I think reflects a broader uh, view in India, which I find a little bit uh, surprising. You know, I, I, normally we think of consumption as a function of income, uh, uh, that, you know, 
C follows Y. But if you look at the debate in India, there's a strong sense that you know C drives Y. You know, consumption growth uh, drives income growth, and so there's a lot of focus on consumption to explain the slowdown. It's possible, but I think we kind of forget that even before whether you know kind of the the actual evidence bears up this inequality plus satiated consumption. I think we forget that you know our periods of high growth, the 90s and the 2000s, were actually driven by exports, trade, and investment. So the high growth era in India has never been a kind of a consumption-driven uh, era. It's been a, an exports, trade, and investment-driven. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so the basic model in India, and this has been true, of course, of the East Asians in spades, of course, consumption does very well, but that's because incomes grow because exports and investment drive the economy. Um, so that's kind of a, a general, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, issue with that hypothesis. Moreover, I think it, to be, f uh, the other thing of course is that, I mean, it's difficult to argue that over the last uh, 25, 30 years, you know, the consumption benefits have not been widely shared. So on the right hand side, uh, you know, uh, Josh put together this, uh, chart on FMCG sales, and you see broadly that, and this is a kind of proxy for middle and lower middle class consumption, you know, it's broadly tracked nominal GDP. So one can't really say that, you know, uh, unless there is more evidence presented that, you know, inequality come uh, satiation uh, is what drove growth, and now that has that has collapsed. So that I think is a, is a, um, and of course on inequality, if we have the time, uh, I'm going to tell you about. Uh, we can talk about how the whole inequality hypothesis growing is also actually much more complicated than than kind of uh, we tend to think, or we th th we tend to think reading you know Piketty uh, and others. So so I think the consumption hypothesis is is uh, is I think needs a lot more evidence to kind of bear it out. Uh, then we have a series of kind of cyclical hypotheses. Something went wrong much more recently. You know, uh, Harish Damodar and others have spoken about weak demand from agriculture. Uh, uh, lots of people, I think, including ELA at some point, maybe not, uh, um, have spoken about tight monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole bunch of people who attribute a lot of the current things to demonetization and the GST. And then, of course, you know, Andy, Mujkaji, others have spoken about the role of financial markets in the most recent slowdown. Now, I'm going to deal with each of these as we go along to show that why these kind of uh, cannot explain uh, what it is that we have to explain. And, and I'll make this clear, hopefully, as we go along. So let me give you what our hypothesis is. Our hypothesis is that the slowdown is severe because it's both structural and cyclical. And the common element to both the long run and the short run, we're going to argue, is the financial system. Uh, 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 and in a sense, I'm also going to argue later on that, you know, in India, we've kind of, we're not used to this kind of financial system crises. Uh, and hence, uh, you know, this is an explanation that I think people still find difficult to buy. Because actually, internationally, if you look at all the work done by Carmen Reinhardt and Rogoff, you know, the whole balance sheet crisis has been something quite well known and has, you know, hit countries uh, very often, you know, across time, across space. Uh, but in India, I think we're still kind of coming to grips with this understanding that, the, that you know, the financial system can be responsible both for the long run and for recent events as well. Uh, so we, we're going to argue that there's a long-term decline because investment and exports collapsed after the global financial crisis. The temporary factors, there was a credit boom that, boom that propped up growth. The bubble burst, growth collapsed. And then this growth collapse itself creates now a, a dangerous, vicious cycle. And what we're going to argue is that, you know, underlying this financial system hypothesis is what uh, are the two waves of a balance sheet problem. What the, the survey first called the twin balance sheet, now we're calling that twin balance sheet one, and then there's a twin balance sheet two. So now we have a, a kind of four balance sheet thing, which kind of explains uh, 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 the, the long run uh, uh, slowdown that we're seeing. Okay, so let me uh, el elaborate on all these. I, I think something we've kind of escaped our notice is that essentially the Indian economy has never really recovered from the global financial crisis. These are, uh, you know, the bars show 
annual average rate of growth in a number of macro demand indicators, red being 10 years before the global financial crisis, blue being uh, you know, after the, what, uh, the, uh, uh, seven years after the global financial crisis. And you see that every macro demand indicator or proxy for it collapses by 10 to 15 percentage points or even 20 percentage points per year. Take, uh, take something like exports, for example. What it's showing is that uh, before the global financial crisis, we were growing at 15 to 15 and a half percent real terms per year. And afterwards, we're only growing at 5 percent. Corporate profits, real profits, were growing at something like 23, 24 percent before. Now they're barely uh, positive. So it's, that's a 20 percentage point decline in the average annual rate of growth. And that's true kind of across the board. Investment, imports also collapses. Uh, and that's why, you know, just as an aside, uh, you see that uh, everything is collapsing like this, but our official GDP growth is saying that actually GDP growth went up, and, and that's kind of uh, the subject. I don't want to dwell on that too much. You know, I've dealt with it earlier, but just to give you a sense of why, uh, you know, we find the GDP numbers difficult, because almost everything collapses by 10 to 20 percentage points, which doesn't show up. Um, so, so this is the kind of the long run factor. Exports slow down, inv investment slows down dramatically, and that's what is, is the structural factor. I'm not going to go into exports. I'm just working on a companion piece on exports, where the surprising thing is that most of our export collapse is almost entirely due to uh, uh, world uh, demand and world, ex world trade collapsing. I, I don't think we did particularly bad on that, but that's, I I'm not going to go into that now. But uh, yeah, just for the record, I think agricultural incomes, not output, also declined over this period, which explains you know, some of the slowdown. Um, why did investment collapse? Uh, and this is where we talk about the twin balance sheet, which we spoke about first in the survey. On the right-hand side, you see the corporate corporate stress. Uh, what this bars, these bars are, they show debt associated, uh, the share of debt associated with companies whose interest coverage ratio is less than one. If your interest coverage ratio is less than one, that you're barely making enough money to repay, uh, repay interest. And that's, as you can see, has been hovering around 35 to 40 plus percent for a very long time after the global financial crisis. Uh, and the counterpart of that is that bank stress, the NPAs, have kind of risen uh, uh, dramatically. So, so the corporate uh, balance sheets are over indebted, so they can't invest. Uh, 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 banks can't lend because of NPAs, and that's the twin balance sheet challenge, which you see, which you see back here. Uh, I need to go back. Um, no, sorry. Um, uh, e essentially, what you uh, sorry, yeah, um, what you see that you know the fact here that investment collapses by about ten percentage points, credit collapses by almost you know seventeen, eighteen percentage points, is just a reflection of that twin balance sheet problem where uh, firms are over indebted, they can't invest, uh, uh, banks. And by and large, these firms are in the infrastructure sector. And you know, one of the really interesting things about the boom was that the infrastructure, lending, infrastructure boom of the 2000s was private sector led, but completely, almost completely financed by public sector banks not by capital markets, not by private banks, but by public sector banks. So this is twin balance sheet one, which explains the dramatic investment credit slowdown after the global financial crisis. Now here's, here's what I think is why you need a unified explanation, because essentially what happens is that what you have to explain also is not just why growth slowed down, but why did it remain you know, moderate? And then why did the economy fizz briefly and then collapse? So essentially, you have to explain a long run slowdown, a fizz or a mini boom, and then a complete collapse. So you have to explain all three. And that's what we try and do this paper. So the question is that why did the economy grow even fizz briefly uh, uh, despite you know, investment and exports collapsing? Of course, we offer three explanations. Uh, just to give you a, uh, you know, a sense of, uh, uh, the, 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 there was, I mean, I hadn't clearly realized that, you see, after, basically after March 2017, there's a four to six year period, six, 
quarter period when the, can, when the economy actually does reasonably well, even kind of fizzes uh, for about four to six quarters. And that's after March 2017. Uh, and that's kind of somewhat of, you know, some suggestive evidence that, you know, whatever demonetization and GST may have done, that there was this mini boom after that, uh, which people have to account for. Uh, <clears throat> And you know, one of the most dramatic things was that you know, capacity utilization, which had been on a long decline, actually picked up again for those four to six quarters between March 2017 and, and uh, late 2018. Um, so why did it the economy not completely collapse, kind of chug along? We saw we had a large uh, decline in oil prices since 2014, so that consumption and government uh, were kept, uh, kept uh, things afloat. And then we come to, I think, what is really interesting. So factor one, oil price collapse also propped up the economy. Factor two, on the right-hand side chart that you see, this is very important, is that we think, or, or the headline story is that the government official numbers do come down, the official deficit does come down. But because of off-balance sheet activities, which you see in the red bar, uh, this is kind of uh, work by Motilal Oswal, very careful. But you know, Sajid has kind of corroborated that. And actually, these numbers are completely consistent with uh, the CAG's numbers as well. What you find is that because of off-balance sheet activities, FCI, NHAI, railways, uh, uh, the, the actual total deficit actually goes up from about 7.6 to 8.8, .8, which is far from being a contraction. You know, uh, government is actually injecting large amounts of demand into the economy, which kind of props up the economy. And then we come to the, the, the third and perhaps the most interesting part of all this is part of the reason the economy fizzes also was, again, beginning June 2017, you see a sharp rise in credit both from the banks and the NBFCs. Now, number of reasons why this happened, but uh, one part of it certainly was, you know, uh, the savings that came back after demonetization, some went into the banking system, some went into mutual funds. So NBFCs were financed both by the banks and the mutual funds, and that's why you see NBFC credit, you know, take off so dramatically. Uh, so, so uh, Long-term decline because exports and investment collapse, temporary factors that prop it up, and now we have to explain the final collapse. So, so, so this is the third part of the story, what explains the collapse. And here, our explanation is that, look, when you look at any kind of financial crises or, or, you know, or major financial upheavals, you, you need both a trigger and some fundamentals. You know, uh, Triggers, it could be anywhere. The trigger could be anywhere. It could happen anywhere. But what those triggers do is suddenly they force a reassessment of what's going on in the financial system. In the case of, uh, 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 firstly, let me show you uh, the collapse when I said, basically, you see credit collapses. That's like a, a brutal crunch of credit uh, in 2018-19. This is commercial credit to the private sector. Uh, ILFS happens in uh, August 2018. Uh, but after 20, between 2018, 19, and the first six months, basically there's, you know, from lots of credit, there's actually no credit in the economy. Uh, uh, and, that's, that's, and that happens. We think the trigger was ILFS. So ILFS was a major event uh, for a number of reasons. It was a major event because, firstly, it was 90,000 crores, which went unspotted in the system. You know, the regulators missed it, the credit rating agencies missed it, uh, and it's just kind of out of the blue it came. Uh, uh, it's, it's, someone has to write a story sometime on, you know, what, a, what, a, what, a, what uh, you know, a kind of catastrophic neglect of regulation uh, ILFS was. But then ILFS also was the trigger that forced a reassessment. You know, the financial sector, sector says, you know, all these rating agencies' ratings now are worthless. Where else are there problems in the system? And of course, the big problem in the system was NBFC lending to real estate. Now, here's again something that, you know, I've actually learned uh, doing this research with Josh, is that the interesting thing is that a lot of the NBFC lending, not all of it, but a lot of it, goes to the real estate sector. The red bar that you see are unsold inventories, this is data for eight cities, but there's also data on 36 cities. Essentially, uh, a credit to a real estate was growing at something like 20% per year for about five years. 
uh, leading up to this thing. And essentially what it's doing, it's not financing new uh, construction and so on. To some extent it is. But essentially it's also financing unsold inventory. So, so the red things that you see, essentially, see, in the boom, people bought houses. Real estate companies pre-sold houses. You know, economy has been weak. They've not been able to uh, repay. And, and so uh, this has been building up. Now, the interesting thing is that in any market, this would clear by inventory being sold. And this is a puzzle that you know, Sunil Jain has also uh, uh, noticed and commented on. Prices, there's, there's not been that much sales, and prices haven't come down that much. Why? Because if prices come down, the, this is actually collateral for your lending. And so if prices come down, the value of your collateral comes down, and therefore financing margin requirements go up. And, and, and if finance is scarce, you know, neither, it's not in the interest of builders, banks, nor indeed the buyers for uh, uh, prices, to allow prices to come down. So that's why we call this the non-bubble bubble. It's because prices don't go up very much. They don't come down very much. Essentially, all the adjustment is taking place through quantities. But this is not sustainable. So the fundamentals are that this is kind of, it's a kind of Ponzi scheme. It's a kind of evergreening that's going on, that you're basically financing more and more inventory. After uh, uh, ILFS, people say this is not a thing. And then what you saw, of course, beginning March uh, or, or January 2019, the mutual funds pull money out of the NBFCs um, and, and the housing, and of course, the the RBI is trying to prop it up through more liquidity, but these companies go, uh, some of them actually go bust, including Divan, and that's why you see the credit crunch. So, so this is a story, therefore, of, uh, uh, no, let, let me finish, let me finish one last thing before I summarize, and this is where we are today. So we, this sh what this chart shows is the difference between borrowing rates, either for the private sector in red and the government in light blue line, the difference between the borrowing rate and the nominal GDP growth rate. So, so for the corporate sector as a whole, think about it this way, that um, firms borrow, they make profits, they repay their loans. Um, uh, uh, for the corporate sector as a whole, a proxy for profit growth is nominal GDP growth. Their borrowing cost is their, is their borrowing cost. And you know, for much of the boom period, growth rates exceeded interest rates by a wide margin. So I minus G was negative in the boom period, but now you see I minus G is hugely positive, which means that where we find ourselves, it's itself going to add to corporate stress because firms are going to find it much more difficult uh, to, to repay their loans. And so corporate stress is going to increase as a result of that. And of course, many people have noted that fiscal dynamics also turn very adverse because we know the debt sustainability equation is that if you broadly are, you know, uh, uh, a primary thing is in balance, I minus G should be close to zero. But now again here, I minus G has become positive. So both for the government, but especially for the private sector, there's a pincer which is going to add to further stress because growth is not going to be, is not strong enough uh, to prop up earnings. So, 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 so this is where I think we, uh, just to summarize, long-term decline, uh, mm, uh, a temporary fizz, and then a collapse linked by this twin balance sheet. So, so just to go back to, uh, I should have said here, so remember now in this TBS2, NBFCs lent to the real estate. So now we have the old TBS1, public sector banks lending to infrastructure companies, TBS1. TBS2 is non-bank financial companies lending to real estate. So now four balance sheets are impaired, and that's what we call now the four balance sheet challenge, which combined with this is what makes the outlook somewhat difficult. Now remedies, I'm going to run through these quickly. We have maybe five to 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, don'ts and do's. Um, I think it's well known that monetary policy, the transmission mechanism has become ineffective. So it's not going to be, you know, rate cuts are not being passed on to lenders because the bank, banks are highly risk averse, are very cautious. That's why we see the spread between the lending and the repo rate rising, even though the repo rate is coming down. I, I think the same thing is true for fiscal policy. 
you know, the, 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 the spread between the term premium, the spread between the policy rate and the 10-year GSEC rate is now also very, very high, basically reflecting the fact that banks are increasingly unwilling to hold government paper. Uh, and so because, again, of the twin balance sheet, four balance sheet challenge. So both monetary policy is ineffective. And notice that I think at the end of this year, it's quite possible that the consolidated uh, government deficit, it's already nine last year. It could, it could uh, reach double digits because this year, because growth is weak, it's going to add, and we know what's happening to revenues on the direct tax and the GST side. So, uh, so both the space and the willingness of the banks to hold more paper means that fiscal policy is also going to be, uh, there's you know, really no space to have uh, expansionary fiscal policy. Um, now, there's a lot of talk about personal income tax cuts. Uh, and raising GST rates, uh, and I would be categorically against both. Uh, I, I think quite apart from the fact that uh, you know we may not have the space, uh, I, I think personal income tax cuts motivated by a desire to increase consumption is highly uh, I, you know, inequitable because if you want to boost consumption, you know, personal income uh, tax cuts benefit you know, the top five to seven percent of taxpayers who are at the upper end of the spectrum. So if you really wanted to boost consumption, it has to be something much that actually reaches much poorer people. It has to be some kind of a DBT or universal basic income type of thing and not an income tax cut. And of course, uh, I think this is something Thing we need to remember that you know all uh, you know countries that develop have you know having more taxpayers in the system uh, is actually uh, you know Im important for long run development as well. Um, raising GST rates, I think you know uh, I, I know what the concern is. It's a kind of GST state center issue, but uh, you know think of it this way. Uh, ostensibly, in order to boost consumption, you want to cut income taxes. But you know, at the same time, you want to raise GS, the low GST rates, which actually is going to be affect consumption of the poor. So it's a little perverse from a kind of even from an own consumption point of view to contemplate cutting uh, income tax rates and raising low GST rates. Um, and in any case, a, a slowdown and a recession is not the time to be uh, you know embarking. So you don't want you, you can't have too much expansionary fiscal policy, but equally you know you can't be kind of crunching a government demand at a time when the economy is weak. You know these multipliers will go uh, against you. So I think we shouldn't do uh, income tax cuts and GST rates as well. See, uh, taking stock of the financial sector, I think one, uh, the government deserves a lot of credit for the IBC. Um, I think for the first time in Indian history, we've had a, a serious mechanism to solve this exit problem, you know, uh, bad companies, weak companies being forced out. Uh, so that's major, I think, achievement. Uh, so to take stock, NPAs are down by about two percentage points. Uh, recapitalization has increased bank capital. Banks are now uh, uh, on a sounder footing. And the IBC has resolved half of the 12 large cases, although they're mostly in steel. But we know that NPAs are still very high. We know credit is co collapsing. And we know it's rising because of new NPAs that are almost certain to come from the uh, uh, real estate sector. Corporate stress in the latest number has jumped to 45%. And if the GDP interest rate thing that we're saying is right, it's going to add even more. Bank lending has stalled. I think power and real estate are major problems. And IBC, a lot of credit. We should you know, give the government a lot of credit. But you know, uh, times have slipped enormously. Uh, 400 plus days for resolution compared to the original 270 days. Recovery rates have been about 50%, but that's mostly because of steel. We don't know how it's going to happen, so we need much more action needed. Uh, you know, I, I think of the financial sector as you know, resolution as having five Rs, recognition, resolution, recapitalization, regulation, reform. Uh, let me just go through two. I think that absolutely a new AQR for NB, you know, uh, we got to know the size of the problem in the banking system in around 2016. Uh, but now, uh, again, there's too much uncertainty about, about how much uh, bad stuff there is in the system. So we need a new honest reckoning with the magnitude of the problem. As we call it a AQR2. And people tend to think that it's only for the NBFCs. But because banks have also lent to the NBFCs, we need to know what's the new amount of bad assets in the uh, banks, public sector banks as well. So we need a new, uh, you know. And, and why why is it important? I think that from a political economy of, 
point of view. If everyone thinks that the magnitude is small, there's no real urgency for political action. So you need to know the true state of what's wrong. And I think that's what happened with AQR1, that people suddenly woke up to the fact that, you know, that we had uh, lots of bad assets, and that created the IBC, and, and you know, that kind of dynamic was uh, set in play. So, so we need a, a, a recognition. We need an AQR2, absolutely urgent in, in, in our view. And then we need, you know, the IBC has to be strengthened. Uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A. But today we have a, a piece saying that, you know, we need a separate resolution res, uh, for real estate and power, something like a bad bank. And let me explain why in the case of power. See, the IBFC, when it works, it's meant to be a, a pure market-driven process that discovers and realizes the, whatever recoverable value there is in an asset. Assets are too bad, you liquidate it. If assets are good, you find the best buyer, you, you change management, uh, write off debt, and you move on. Now, in the, real, in the power sector, the underlying value of the asset very much depends upon government policy and on coordination between government. A lot of these, uh, the plant load factors in the private sector are low, but these new private sector plants in thermal are in fact more uh, therm thermally, environmentally efficient than the older ones. So we can't just kind of liquidate these assets. These are more efficient than the old assets. So we need to find ways of recovering value. You know, tariffs will have to go up. We may have to you know, stop producing the old inefficient ones and replace them with these new ones. Whatever it is, if government policy and government coordination, uh, if asset value depends on that, therefore, by definition, uh, you know, the resolution process also has to be led by government. A and in an IBC process, you cannot have that because to be, you know, to be faithful, the IBC process should be a purely market-led process, but here, uh, and you know, where the government doesn't come in, but that's not appropriate for the power sector, and that's why I think we need, and the similar arguments at work for the real estate sector as well. Um, I don't want to go into regulation reform, it's, it's too big a story, but I would say that you know, on recapitalization, we've almost done three and a half lakh crores, and I think we should now uh, think about you know, linking recapitalization to banking reform, because banking reform is, is overdue. Um, two last slides, and I'm going to finish. Um, so. I, I, do, I began by saying that there's something about the collective social cognition that, you know, even in diagnosing the problem, which tends not to, you know, kind of fully understand, you know, that financial crises of this sort can take a long-term toll on the economy. The pushback, of course, is that, aha, uh -huh, we've had similar things before. After all, in the early 2000s, we had much higher NPAs, and we kind of solved that problem. So what's different this time? And I think there are some major differences between that episode and this episode. One, uh, 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 it's true that NPAs were very high, but credit as a share of GDP today is almost 25 percentage points more than it was then, uh, you know, so it matters more. Then interest rates were very, very high. Banks were holding a lot of SLRs. So when these interest rates came down, they made sh humongous profits, and that was one way they kind of uh, got out of the problem. Today, we don't have that luxury. You know, interest rates are low. Banks hold uh, less paper. So that's not a pr uh, you can't get out of it. And moreover, I think today the stress is much more widespread than it was then. And uh, final point is that we're already 10 years, you know, if you say we're going to count on growth to get over the problem, we're al already 10 years into the problem, and the NPAs are at least as high as they were when we began with, if you take into account the new NBFC problem. So I think, you know, the historical comparison is very different. This, the two, the twin balance sheet problems have led to what I would call a slow bleed. And that's why I think the metaphor of why the puzzle that I began with, why is it that we suddenly went from great to kind of not so good is because uh, it's, it's a bit like a frog and the boiling well. We've had, you know, a slow bleed over a very long time. Frog hasn't realized there's a problem, and suddenly the boiling point has happened, and the frog has jumped out of the well. Um, I, I think, I, I don't want to go into it, Clearly, we also need to fix agriculture, and, and we can talk about that. It is, should be high priority, but I'm a bit uh, not so sanguine about how easily it can be done. I've written something on, on data systems, uh, uh, Josh and I. I, I mean, I, I could spell out five you know, major questions that the government confronts today, 
to which we don't have really good, you know, reliable answers. Is GDP, you know, 5% or 2%? We don't know. You know, has poverty gone up, come down? We don't know. Uh, 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 unemployment gone up? Don't know. Fiscal, uh, you know, deficit is three and a half, whatever, or is it much greater as CNG says? We don't really know. Financial system, you know, is are the stressed assets what uh, is being claimed, or are they much greater? We don't know. So we need to fix our data systems. So concluding, economy is in intensive care due to stru structural and cyclical factors. No quick solutions because fixing the four balance sheet challenge is going to be very difficult. Uh, and let, let me say one thing. I know that you know down the road, uh, I'm going to be accused of doom mongering. Let me say this very categorically, that it is inevitable that over the next few quarters, there will be good news. That's the nature of the beast. You know, uh, you know economy goes up, goes down, but, I would warn against the complacency because you know that early signs of good news should not be mistaken for you know permanent good news because we have some fundamental structural issues which need to be solved and I worry most about the complacency that might come up when in fact uh, some of these things start turning up. I do think we need to moderate our long run growth expectations, both because the international environment, you know, export uh, thing is very difficult, trading opportunities are declining, and also because this financial system jam uh, is not going to be easy to uh, to get out of. But finally, I would, uh, you know, I would also you know, want to conclude on a slightly more, opt you know, uh, 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 not so negative note because I do, I mean, while I think there may be new exogenous factors that come in the way of countries like India, I don't think, uh, you know, the metaphor of the trap for me is a problem. It almost suggesting that, you know, because of exogenous factors, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, uh, our hands are bound. I think that, you know, uh, some of these wounds are self-inflicted. So if the wounds are self-inflicted, you know, we can get out of them through action as well. So, so uh, bottom line is that, uh, you know, the, the problems are serious and protracted. Uh, 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 we need to moderate our expectations, uh, but uh, not so much as to say, you know, we can't do anything about it. We can do certain things, but hard work lies ahead, especially on the financial system. Sorry. Thank you very much. Huh?